I think it's really important to just to get at this idea of the scapegoat mechanism becoming less effective because of society's concern for victims and nobody hated. So which, you know, Gerard would say this, our, our concern for victims is the universal value that now unites the world. Pretty much who will you ever find that says that you shouldn't be concerned with victims or, you know, people being injustice, right? Um, and Gerard says, this is really the fruit of the revelation of the scapegoat mechanism. We've now seen something that we can never unsee. And mm -hmm. it sort of led over 2000 years, it led over a very long period of time to that becoming the, the most important value in the world to the point that there's now mimetic rivalry over who can be the best victim because nothing is, nothing confers more status and power than becoming a good victim. It's a weird, weird, um, paradox and inversion of, yeah. of like the true nature of, of, of Christianity. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. Hello, everybody. I am here with Luke Bridges. We've been trying to meet for months, actually. And we finally were able to meet. Uh, he is the author of Wanting the Power of Mimetic Desire in Everyday Life and an expert on René Girard, and you know he's been following what I've been doing as well, and seeing me talk about sacrifice and René Girard. So I'm definitely excited to see you know what kind of insight he can bring to us. So, Luke, it's good to meet you. Hey, Tell us I'm... a bit about about what brought you to thinking about uh, Girard and, and mimetic desire today. Yeah, well, I'm glad we finally got to make this happen, Jonathan. Um, I've been following your work for a while, and it was a, a consolation for me uh, in the dark days of the pandemic. Uh, yeah, so I think fundamental to, to Girard is, um, you know, he he explained the nature of desire in a way that I had simply never heard before. And I came across his work after I myself had underwent a complete um, revolution in my life uh, in my late 20s, um, a sort of a religious conversion, like a very sort of dramatic spiritual conversion. And I realized that the very nature of it was related to my my own desires, right? The, mm -hmm. the nature of desires. I'd never sort of understood a telos or teleology to desire before. And then I realized that I, I had some, but I, I went most of my life totally blind to my own desires as, as most of us are, right? Uh, and in many ways I still am. So Gerard's work having revolved around desire was especially intriguing to me and gave me some language to sort of understand uh, humanity and and myself both, and you know, fundamental to Girard's thought, in, in my opinion, is that human beings are religious uh, creatures. Even if you don't think you are, we're religious creatures. And if you don't sort of accept that premise, there's all kinds of things about the world that you want to understand. Um, I know that you know that, <laughs> but uh, you know, this this was um, uh, really uh, really eye opening to me, sort of an understanding the, the world. And I, in my opinion, what's central to his thought is the human desire for transcendence. Mm -hmm. um, and Gerard articulated this, his notion of desire in a very sort of spiritual way that human beings seek transcendence, whether they, they, they know they are or not. And the notion of transcendence is, run, is the thread that I think runs through all of Gerard's work. The very idea of the scapegoat mechanism, for instance, right, is is a form of false transcendence, right? It's a it's a form of people trying to you know achieve something beyond themselves, um, and and prevent some form of destruction. Um, but it's a form of false transcendence. So you know, as as one who had been a, a, a striving my entire life for something that I couldn't quite put my my finger on. Gerard helped me make sense of, of so much of the kind of uh, religious quest and search that I was on, which I didn't even quite frankly know that I was on uh, until he sort of introduced me to some very ancient concepts, quite frankly, right? Like fundamental things um, that uh, at least religious traditions have known, uh, you know, for, for a very long time, um, you know, especially in, in, in scripture. And he sort of gave me a lens to see those things in, in an entirely new light. Um, in, in some senses, I was, um, you know, uh, 
a bit arrogant in the way that I approached the um, sort of religion of my youth, you know, like reading the Bible, it doesn't have anything very interesting to say to me. Um, you know, Augustine of Hippo thought the same thing uh, when he first, you know, read the Bible, right? It's not very, in many, many cases, not very beautiful language. There's some weird things going on. I was a, a bit similar to that. And Gerard sort of gave me a lens, like, a lens, uh, like glasses to sort of see myself in the story and to realize that I'm a participant in this story um, and, and to sort of see the way that I was, I was part of that story. So, um, you know, I, Gerard couldn't be more relevant, I think, to the, to the modern world. He explains so much when it comes to the, the world grappling with false, false ways of trying to achieve transcendence and uh, is so relevant to, to your work, I think, because Gerard was an expert at recognizing patterns. So he, he recognized patterns in human behavior. He recognized patterns in the nature of human desire, a structure to desire, uh, specifically mimetic desire. And he recognized, so at the micro level, he recognized these patterns. And then at the macro level, he saw that these problems of desire manifest themselves in patterns of, of conflict, rivalry, uh, and violence at the macro level in human culture. So what is what is the relationship? Could you talk about this idea of the desire for transcendence? And so what is the relationship between mimetic desire uh, and and uh, desire for transcendence? So mimetic desire, it just it, if you're hearing the word for the first time or the, the term for the first time, uh, Gerard sort of coined the, this phrase mimetic desire um, to to say that human beings do not create their own desires ex nihilo out of nothing, right? Um, desire is not our own creation. Uh, and there's a whole theology behind this, right? We can go back to sort of creation theology and the creation of the world. Um, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the author of all of my own desires. Um, even though, you know, we, many of us think that we are right a lot. So, the, the nature of desire, because we're social creatures, because we're part of a story, uh, we affect each other, right? And we, we affect each other's desires. And mimetic desire simply means imitative desire. So we imitate the desires of other people as, as part of the social process. So desire is formed through this, this highly social process, uh, through rituals, through the culture that we're part of. Uh, and especially through um, specific people or groups that have a, a special importance to us that that act as models or mediators of, of our desire. So, you know, if you grew up um, in, a, in a strong uh, religious Christian home, some of your models of desire might be the saints. Uh, if you grew up in other kinds of communities, every kind of community has certain models of desire. These are people that are sort of held up as exemplars. They bind people together. Um, in sports, right, there might be some really great professional athletes that act as models of desire. So models of desire help help inform our own desires and give shape to those desires, whether we know it or not. And we we usually don't know that this process is is happening. But the reason that models of desire affect us the reason that they're that they have some power over us in the first place according to gerard is because we are seeking a sense of transcendence and we we're looking for a higher level of being right some to, to move into some higher level of reality and we we look to people that model various desires to us as maybe possessing some quality of being that we lack right mm -hmm. um some, some quality of being that we lack. And we sort of enter into their orbit for better or worse, right? This can work in positive ways or negative ways. Um, I can think of all kinds of positive examples of entering into the orbit of somebody who's modeling a desire for something like good and noble. Um, but very often we sort of look to our right and our left and we find somebody that appears to have some quality of being or some higher level of being that, that we seek. And they become models of desire for us in some in some way. Um, it seems to become extremely true in the world of influencers, like the YouTube, Instagram type influencer, where in some ways the person is really just does become a focus of desire. They they just buy a bunch of stuff, they wear a bunch of clothes. They 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 don't, it's not actually a quality that is. They don't seem to have virtues. They just seem to actually be desire holes, like like vortexes of desire that are celebrated because they're able to 
we can live our our excessive desires kind of through them, something like that. It's very odd. Yeah, so it's the influencer. It's the model that has the power over us. It's not the it's not the objects themselves, right? It's like the definition of mimetic desire is that the choice of the objects that we're fascinated with uh, come from the model and not from the objects themselves, right? Not from any objective qualities of the objects. They're just imbued with some kind of symbolic, magical quality because of whoever our model of desire is, right? Like what's what's a, a, a watch other than some kind of talisman of some right. kind of you know weird status that yeah. every man over a certain age that works on wall street ha wears like one of six different types of watches that all happen to be in the magazines that you see at hudson news and airports they, they're they're symbolic these things are literally symbols of some kind of um quality of being or something like that right so these models have have is, are what's powerful for us, not the objects themselves. And this creates problems, a lot of problems, because we have a love hate relationship with anybody who's a model of, of desire for us, because those those same people act as obstacles mm -hmm. to us. Right. Because then we start competing with them for the same things and measuring everything that we do according to the models. So, you know, this this leads to rivalry, right? This is a huge part of Gerard's theory is that mimetic desire, the fact that our desires are formed in this through the social process with other people leads to conflict and, and to rivalry. Uh, and, and some really weird things, right? Like Gerard said one time, yeah, I think the reason that we talk about envy so much is that nobody wants to talk about sex, right? Like envy is the form in which mimetic desire takes in, in, in the modern world. And then you have somebody like, um, like in Montero, we see he, there's some line where he says, I want to F the ones I envy. Yeah. Right. So, you know, this crude way that that that's literally like Gerard, like Gerardian, most Gerardian statement that he could possibly make. Yeah. Because the, the reason that he wants to have sex with the person he envies, the person that he envies is somehow a model of desire for him. And through that act, you're somehow achieving uh some 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 form of equality with the being of the model right yeah some kind um, of so, integration you're like integrated to them or, or joined with them somehow yeah yeah so so we, we have a love-hate relationship with models that leads to rivalry um ultimately misery and then on the macro level that plays out in in very strange ways in our society as well um which is a whole another part of Gerard's theory. But I, going back, I mean, I, I, this all has to do with transcendence, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. This this human desire to sort of go go beyond their current level level of being, and there are sort of vertical forms of transcendence, um, which are, are found, you know, really in, in mostly in religion, spirituality, and then I, there are what I would call sort of horizontal forms of transcendence, where we try to find transcendence and all kinds of, of, of strange ways, right? Like through just trans shape shifting and transforming our identity and changing jobs um, and looking for it in all the wrong places, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so the vertical transformation, the vertical call for transcendence could account also for things like generals, let's say Alexander or people who inspired their men to be, have certain qualities. And so it's not all positive, but it, it, it would, you know, he would appear as someone who kind of drew people's desire into him and they would see him as an example, but also someone to impress, someone to outdo all of this, all this kind of happening. Imagine it in sports, you see, you can see that quite clearly as well in terms of, of the relationship between players within a team and then with the other team, how those things play out in terms of, of mimetic desire. Yeah, I mean, a, a sports team that kind of loses some, uh, that loses some kind of transcendent purpose, like some kind of like telos, like outside of the team itself, just locker, the locker room just devolves very, very quickly, right? You sort of like forget what it is that you're, that you're doing. Um, and I guess it's why, like, I don't know, like why some players or teams that um, win all of the time, uh, like what, what's, what's next in the teleology for that team? Like what, what happens next, right? And that's usually why people don't stay on top for very long, because um, you can only sort of go so far. And if you're seeking, for, like, what's next, right? I don't know. You win the Super Bowl three times in a row. What can you possibly do? I don't know. Tom Brady goes to the Hall of Fame. Like, at, at, at some point, you, it sort of exhausts its its purpose. for Exhausted for by the category of the sport itself. It's like, you know, yeah. 
Like, are now we're going to go like take over a country? No, that doesn't work. Like, it's like you reach the limit and then it's held in by that very category. Yeah. yeah. So it, it happens in sports teams. It, it, this happens within companies all of the time. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, we live in a world where there's a hierarchy of, of values. There's a hierarchy of being. Um, again, this is a very ancient uh, religious concept, right? Um, and I think modern in the modern world, people that reject that idea um, do all kinds of weird things that end up resulting in more conflict and not less, right? They do things in the name of, um, in the name of progress that actually uh, increase conflict, right? So to give you an example, right? Like if there's a hierarchy, if we live in a hierarchical world and people are sort of looking to other people as, as models of desire, and by the way, it's very important for a culture to have like positive, like models period, <laughs> but especially positive models. Um, so there's like a, a weird thing happens, right? Like one of the stories I talk about in the book is, you know, Zappos.com decided to like move from a more traditional management structure, mm -hmm. which, you know, they, they have their problems, right? I'm like, not, I'm not a fan of bureaucracy or anything like that to just totally collapsing the entire hierarchy overnight turned everybody that worked there into like very confused and in total crisis mode and chaos because they literally collapsed their entire hierarchy almost overnight. And I don't think that they understood um, that's the sort of the, the nature of reality itself is hierarchical. And if you're going to collapse it visibly, what happens is that an invisible hierarchy sort of develops under the surface that becomes like a dragon. You don't mm -hmm. even know it's there. You don't even know how it operates, right? I think something, is, something similar is happen, happening with the sexes where we sort of like, uh, not necessarily collapsing hierarchy, but, but collapsing difference, right? Mm -hmm. Like collapsing difference and not admitting of complementarity, not admitting just fundamental things. It, it leads to a situation where people are trying to reconstitute reconst some form of hierarchy in all kinds of different different ways because we we have like a need to do that yeah and you end up having both confused identities you have these confused kind of uh gender roles and gender identities but you also have hyper versions of extremes you know i pointed this out to someone recently you know you people think that it's only the, the this kind of uh, leveling of gender only leads to, you know, let's say all the letters and, and all of this kind of fluidity, but it also leads to, you know, hypermasculinity and a kind of hypersexualized masculinity and hypersexualized femininity. The types of characters you see in media today, like this kind of hyper male and let's say kind of whore woman, something that would never would, would never have been public in the world, you know, for thousands of years, you never would have seen these kind of characters paraded out in public, but now it's become completely normal to see these hypersexualized beings, uh, you know, and hypergendered beings in ways that are that are that are very surprising. And at the same time, watching everything become fluid and break down in terms of, of uh, identity at the same time. It's like you need a proper, like you said, proper hierarchy that leads to, to some kind of real transcendence. Right. Yeah. So I, I've, you know, I big part of Gerard's thinking does have to do with sacrifice. And that's kind of what I would call the societal macro community level um, pattern that he recognized, right? Something that happens at the community level. Because when, when a person, when anybody is seeking transcendence, there's sort of something that has to die in order for them to achieve this sort of uh, different quality of being that they're, that they're looking for, right? So that happens at the individual level, but it can also happen kind of at the societal level. And, you know, I've listened to your, your kind of theory on sacrifice. Um, and I know you mentioned Gerard in it, but I'm just curious as to, you know, do, do you think that Gerard's sort of idea of the scapegoat mechanism squares with what you were saying? Um, or do you, do you think it's sort of just like a, a subset of a larger kind of theory of, of sacrifice? That's what I, I think. But I mean, maybe you can help me understand it better for me to change my mind. I'd be fine with changing my mind. But it seems when I look at sacrifice, what I see, the Yom Kippur sacrifice is probably the best version of a sacrifice because it's an atonement sacrifice. It's an, you know, it's an at one minute sacrifice. It's the, the sacrifice that makes us one. And it has two sacrifices as part of it. There is on the one hand, the scapegoat sacrifice that really where you take a goat, you put all your all your evil on it and you kind of kick it out, you abuse it, whatever. And then it falls off a cliff or it runs into the desert to, to be 
become food for the demon. But then you also have uh, another sacrifice, which is the pure animal, which is sacrificed up towards God. Uh, and what I see in sacrifice, at least in scripture, is those two types of sacrifices. One which we could be called a scapegoat sacrifice, and you see it in a lot of cultures, you're right, sacrificing a prisoner, sacrificing, uh, you know, you see they did it even all the way up to Roman times when they would have uh, people fight in the, in the arenas. It was basically a, a human sacrifice of their cap, their captives in order to kind of manifest the glory of Rome in, in, in doing it. But then you also have a sacrifice, which I would call a vertical sacrifice, which is giving the best up. And and when you give the best up, and then that constant that is part of what constitutes the the body. And I've talked about it, like let's say in terms of a sports team. On the one hand, you you do have to scapegoat in the sense that you can't let anybody into your your sports team, right? You have to eliminate behaviors and players that don't fit into the team. That's necessary. Um, but then you also need to give your intention and your and your will and your best up towards the goal of what you're doing. So that's what I see these two. And so I don't know if Gerard accounts for them with his scapegoat sacrifice or if he has two theories or I don't know. Yeah, I don't think there's any conflict between what Gerard is saying and, and kind of what I've what I've heard you articulate, which is just it's simply like the bro- a broader view of sacrifice. I don't think Gerard, I think he he identified a very particular kind of sacrifice. And I agree with you that there's all kinds of other sacrifices that don't necessarily fit into the pattern of the scapegoat uh, mechanism necessarily. It's like, for I, sure, I think, him yeah. identifying that has been amazing. I think it's been really oh, yeah. to understand Christianity, but then also to understand the 20th century and to understand a lot of the things that, that we went through, you know, uh, mm-hmm. as Christianity kind of started collapsing as well. Have you thought, has, did Gerard talk about, because one of the things that we say, we, myself and also the people at uh, Lord of Spirits, is we say, you know, Christ is both goats. That is, mm-hmm. in the Yom Kippur sacrifice, Christ seems to be both the sacrifice of the the one who accepts to be the sacrifice of the stranger outside the city, who takes on the sins, who accepts the blame, all of that. But then he also is something like the sacrifice of the firstborn. And the sacrifice of the firstborn, even in scripture, is not the same as the scapegoat sacrifice. So I don't I don't know. Like I also don't know if Gerard accounts for that idea. Like when when Abraham is gonna sacrifice Isaac, it's not a scapegoat sacrifice. He's he's supposed to offer his best up to God. Um and so I don't know. Yeah, th- th- these are things that I that I that I think about, but I'm not an I don't know Gerard well enough to to be able to. Yeah, well, I want to go back to you, you, your idea of what I like sort of horizontal and vertical sacrificing up triggered an idea. So I want to get, but what you're saying now brings, um, brings up questions like atonement theology that are super complex and we, we don't need to necessarily get into those right now. But there is an idea, I think you have to be careful that there is one conception of, of you know, Christ's sacrifice on the cross is sort of, you know, God needing some kind of blood sacrifice, right? Yeah, and, I don't see and, it that way either. No, I don't no, like no, that. Either, either do I, right? And, and Gerard in his earlier days was sort of implying that. And then he befriended this old um, priest. Uh, I shouldn't call him old. I don't know how old they were when he met. But in, in, in Austria, Father Raymond Schwager, who sort of helped Gerard understand the theological implications of what he was saying. And um, I mean, I, I come from just in a very old tradition of Augustine and Aquinas and Gregory of Nyssa and, and Irenaeus. And my, my understanding is that, you know, God could have achieved the salvation of the world in, in, in uh, many, many different ways, right? And it ne- needed not be that particular way, but this was a sacrifice of love, right? And in some senses, it was this the most perfect uh, sort of way, but, but needed not be that, right? So in other words, it's not like we... You know, we chose to like affect what we thought was going to be yet one more effective scapegoat mechanism, mm-hmm. like right. And yet, it, the whole thing was subverted by by the by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross because there was the the, the Holy Spirit sort of enlightened the, the the minds after the resurrection of a very very small group of Christians that for the very first time 
sort of saw the mechanism that was taking place and saw like what we had brought on ourselves. So it's a big difference by us sort of uh, being responsible for the violence and God being responsible for the violence, right? Mm -hmm. Big, big difference, right? So it, it was the, it's the revelation that we had. So God gave the revelation for us to be able to see the scapegoat mechanism in its fullness for the first time mm -hmm. through the crucifixion. It's not the first time that it was ever, um, there were never hints of it. I mean, the Old Testament is full of the story of Joseph and his brothers gives us a perspective of what's going on that there's really no comparable for in any other kind of literature. Like we see that Joseph is in, innocent and sort of the victim of the scapegoating through the whole story. It's almost like we, ha we have the, um, the director's cut from the standpoint of, the, of Joseph or something, right? And we know that he's not responsible for this. Yeah, yeah and the, the, to, yeah. The, the, but there's, it's hard to, sacrifice is one of the hardest things to think about, by the way, <laughs> to be honest, it is so yeah. difficult to think about because in some ways so primordial and so encompassing. But so what, one, one of the things you see, I think, this is my, my perception also what, of what Christ is doing. One of the things he's doing is that by willingly becoming someone's scapegoat, you could say, he's almost he's kind of flipping or joining the two sacrifices together, where mm -hmm. by be by in his willingness to die for others, you could say, he's turning the scapegoat sacrifice into something like the 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 sacrifice of good odor, right? This idea of like yeah. of the best which is given up. Um, and the reason also why I think that that's happening is because then you see that pattern pattern modeled in in uh, the early Christian martyrs, where the martyrs are basically saying, "I'll be your scapegoat," and then that scapegoat will become like a a sacrifice of worship up to God, and it's going to secretly change you without you even knowing what's going on. It's like, if I, if I do that and, and I don't, like I tell people, like, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to die. I don't want to, I don't want people to kill me. I, I'm not, but, but I can see it that that seems to be what's going on. It's like, there's a mechanism. It really is like a mechanism where so, self-sacrifice seems to be the place where these two sacrifices get joined. And it's like a refounding of reality. If you do it properly. I think that's, I think that's right. And that's, um, there's a, it this the idea of self self sacrifice is the key to I think understanding right like Christianity um, and and what's happening in in the liturgy as well. So um, God willing, you you or I will not have to become red martyrs, blood martyrs, and, and physically, uh, who knows? Um, yeah, and and you know, give up our bodies and blood. But there's what what's happening in the Christian liturgy in Orthodox and in the web is is a participation in that self-sacrificial act on the cross, right? So it's got what they, you know, the early church called white martyrdom, or you know, it's it's a it's still a form of dying to yourself and self-sacrifice that, you know, if you're if you really understand what's happening, you're sort of uniting your self-sacrifice to Christ's self-sacrifice on the cross, and it's all being offered offered you know um, and there's something really beautiful about that and and remembering part of a liturgy is anamnesis it's a remembrance of of you know what is what has happened right it only had to happen once right it doesn't mean that we can't continue to participate in it but it's a remembrance of that singular event um, and also very importantly a remembrance of I and mean, this is why you know good friday is so important and i always for me it's always like one of the most I mean, it's the solemn and, and powerful sort of liturgies of the year because it's a rem remembrance of um, of the scapegoat mechanism and what the pattern of human behavior. It's almost as if we we keep we default back to the old rites, to the old sacrificial rites that involve not self sacrifice but sacrifice of other people to preserve ourselves. Mm -hmm. So sacri there's an, there's an element of like self preservation in sacrifice yeah of course huge yeah, element yeah. of to protect protect myself and it's if that's like my default mode of being then i will inevitably sacrifice somebody else at the altar of my of myself 
So there's an, an aspect of remembering our, our tendency to engage in that kind of behavior and then to see, I mean, every week or every day, right, to, to, to see actually how that's been completely transformed into an act that can be an act of love. Mm -hmm. And does, I'm, I've been curious about this, does Gerard talk about the eating part of sacrifice? Does he address that in his theory or do he just talk about the killing part, let's say, in terms of sacrifice? Because of course, this we don't eat the scapegoat. Nobody eats the scapegoat, but you eat other sacrifice. Like the sacrifice up, you tend to eat it. It's part of the part of the sacrifice that you offer it to God, but then you it becomes your body as well. So, mm -hmm. so in the, the, the Hebrew sacrifices, you would give the meat up and then you would eat it. Um, or in the Greek sacrifices that joke about how, you know, they would offer up the bones, they trick the gods and then they would eat the meat, you know, but, but does, I don't know if Gerard talks about the, the eating part. He, he, in, in terms of like, like consuming the, the very like being of the other person, like in, in the act of eating, he, not a lot. I think that it's in violence in the sacred, um, his book from the seventies, um, you know, Orphic religions or Orphism um, was sort of founded on this premise of, um, you know, Dionysus, right, being like ripped apart and, and eaten by the Titans. And, yeah. you know, that that formed the basis of a lot of cults for them. Um, I just wrote an article uh, just a few weeks ago about the cultural fashion fascination with cannibalism. Like what? Yeah, what right now it's like what so the hell is going on with that? Right? There's a movie with Timothy Timothy Chalamet coming out where he's like this teenage cannibal who's on this like love adventure across the country. I haven't seen it. I don't think it's out in theaters yet. But I I saw the premiere for that and I was like, wow, there's been like a lot of movies about cannibalism lately, like Jeffrey Dahmer on Netflix. Like what's going on there? Are like are people somehow like I don't know. Right. Like somehow yeah. fascinated by this idea. I think they are. I think I think it's definitely happening. And it's not just movies and TV. It's it's the idea of also the idea of growing your own meat. Like you saw a lot of that. But like for some reason, they're always talking about how you could grow your own meat, like you could grow your own flesh and you could eat yourself. Let's say it has to do with it has to do with like self causation and this problem of it, it all of these types of symbolism like incest cannibalism they're all related because they're about their and uh, sodomy as well i'm afraid so it has to do with like self causation it's like it's it's not normal normal uh procession of being it's like a a, a, a circular type of causation right. so that's why it, it has to do with clowns and carnival and vampires and all of, and, and, all of that yeah. stuff is all related so it's not surprising mm -hmm. that cannibalism will appear and so also will more and more just the idea of suicide as a um as a normal part of reality the idea of, of self-killing self-creation self-identification all these things are all related to this kind of circular causality yeah yeah and and suicide um not to go off on a tangent but there's a, a very mimetic quality to suicides as, as well right like the the imitation of a desire that one may have not uh had before it's 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 modeled and, and actually carried out in some way um you know there's probably something to be said about school shootings and it, the point is violence whether it's violence to oneself or violence to others according to gerard is one of the most mimetic kinds of behaviors right it's mimetic contagion it's it's contagious right this this desire for self-preservation or the desire to for vengeance these things have some kind of a, of a mimetic quality to them uh, before I forget, you know, this this point that you made about some like the sort of noble, I'll, I'll call it the noble sacrifice of the best, mm -hmm. right? That form of sacrifice, um, as I read Gerard, the way that he describes the scapegoat mechanism happening, it can happen in sort of in two in two forms, right? One of them, one is just pure self-preservation um, of, of a community needing to having um, decomposed uh, and needing to reconstitute itself through this false transcendence that it tries to achieve through singling out the cancer, at, usually in the form of a person or a group of people which it expels or, or eliminates. Um, interestingly enough, there's, there's often a, the sacrifice only works if the person being sacrificed is not too strange, right? There has to be some similarity to the people that are that are doing the scapegoating. 
So in ancient cultures, you had, um, you know, if, it, if an animal was going to be sacrificed, that animal would need to be dressed up like a human, would need to be fed human things and sort of integrated into the community before it worked. So there was like a kindredness uh -huh. before it worked as an effective sacrifice. Um, this, by the way, this is Gerard's sort of like weird theory about the domestic, how the domestication of animals happened, right? Uh -huh. Like dogs and, and, and cats. So they were literally used for human sacrifice, but they had to be domesticated first or else the sacrifice wasn't as effective. So there's, there's something sort of weird about that. They're different. They're different species, different creature, yet we have to sort of see ourselves in them in some way for the sacrifice. Enough. Yeah, enough for you to recognize what you're doing, let's say, because it's like you sacrifice a flower, you know, it has no... It has no connection with you, you know, although you could offer flowers though, you could offer them up, but not that kind of scapegoat sacrifice. That's no. for sure. No. So the, so the, the idea of similarity is really important in Girard. So the two, the two concepts of similarity and proximity, right? right. These are, these are what really trigger a mimetic crisis and eventually the scapegoat mechanism. So um, as you know, like the, the, the symbolism of the twins is really important. Mm -hmm. in, in, in Girard, you know, it's really weird. In almost every culture in the world, you have a myth where there are twins, usually identical twins, that one of them ends up killing the other one, or they yeah. end up committing violence against one another, right? In the book of Genesis, I believe there are five stories of sibling rivalry alone in the book, in the, just in the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. Cain kills Abel, founds a city, right? Then you have uh, Joseph and his brothers, you have Jacob and Esau, and you've got a who are twins, like clearly, like they're clearly twins. That's the Ex explicit one. Yeah, yeah, that's the explicit one. So the, the similarity seems to breed conflict. Mm -hmm. right? um, there, there's a um, there. It leads more easily to a conflict of desire or uh, the the desire to differentiate one oneself. Romulus and Remus, right? The founders of Rome. They're these mythological uh, twins, and there's not enough room for the both of them. So that leads to conflict. And then proximity, right? Proximity. So again, twins are in close proximity to one another. These are what Gerard calls internal mediators of desire, right? Internal meaning that they're inside of my world. So the scapegoat mechanism only happens with people that are in close proximity to each other, mm -hmm. right? Like, like within the community. That's part of why the sacrificed animal needed to sort of become more um, alike, right? It needed to become in internal to the community. So he wouldn't have seen, for example, the killing of foreign captors, uh, foreign foreign prisoners, as a scapegoat mechanism, because that seems to be a universal practice too. It's like you 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 win a war, you catch a bunch of people, then you ceremoniously murder some of them publicly in order to make a point about you know about your nation and about your strength, you know, up and against another another group, let's say. Um, I don't know if he would have, I don't know if he would have said that, but that doesn't seem to be effective anymore. Right. I mean, and then that, that could be because, um, maybe, it, maybe at one point that was effective, but it doesn't seem effective anymore when that's, when that's happening. Maybe it's because it's not visible or something like that. Um, and this is part of Gerard's whole thesis is that the scapegoat mechanism is becoming less and less effective, right? It doesn't work any anymore the way that it used to before it was sort of revealed to, to humanity. Mm -hmm. And the concern for victims prevents the scapegoat mechanism. Like our eyes are somehow opened to, to, to the victim. And mm -hmm. that is a direct result of sort of what's been shown to us in, in the revelation, really in, in the, in the scriptures. And it makes the scapegoat mechanism less less effective. So we need we either need more of them, we need we need them more often, and they simply don't work to bind people together. I guess in extraordinary cases, the scapegoat mechanism has worked to bind the world together. You could argue that the Holocaust, um, you know, in, in in some sense did that, and like we we're all united in this belief, like this can never happen again. Yeah. Um, but I've actually uh, argued that 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 Hiroshima was a human sacrifice in the sense that Americans said clearly, we have to kill these innocent people in order to stop the war. We have to kill these tens of thousands of innocent people, and in one sh in one shot, 
Uh, and if we do that, then we'll get a blessing from heaven. Like we will, we will end the war um, because it, they weren't killing soldiers and it wasn't, it was like a gamble almost. It really was. It was very similar to the cliche of how people think human sacrifice used to happen, right? It's like, you know, if I kill this person, you know, then, then the rain will come or something like that. And it was like, that's what Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, I think. Yeah. That's sort of what a, cal- a calculated human sacrifice in the sense yeah. that, we knew that innocent lives were going to be lost, but not knowing the future, just hoping that there was some kind of a, I don't know, would you say it was like a, a binding force or just pure like deterrent and fear? I think it was also a binding, a binding force. I think it, mm. it for sure it, it created, I think the United States in like the United States is born in Hiroshima in some ways uh, in terms of what it would become because it's like the 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 radical action and the 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 result of it let's say ending the war this kind of terrible thing terrible terrible action <clears throat> at the outset uh it seemed to be a kind of founding i think uh for mm. america you know leading into the, the the next phase of their existence so but i don't know like like i said that's my intuition in terms of watching it well, i i think i think the intuition is 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 I think is right. I mean, in the sense that Gerard said that every culture is founded on some, on a founding murder. Yeah. So, so culture is, is, is always founded on some violent act. It's, it's why culture emerges as um, the ritualized, like, like rituals and culture are and institutions arise to prevent the violence of the founding murder from happening again. Mm -hmm. And And in, in that sense, I sort of see, it's not like America's only had one culture. I think we've had like a special culture since World War II. Yeah. And 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 like maybe maybe that I'm just talking out loud here. I've never thought about this, but like may, maybe that's the founding murder of the new um post-World War culture. Yeah. And consensus, right? That that we've had, right? These these founding murders and yeah, there's a few secret scandals in World War II that we can't that nobody thinks about because they become they kind of landed so deep in in our psyche. The other example is that we always said we won the war, but you know, we never say that it was actually the Russians in greatly that won the war and those Russians we basically shook the hand with the devil in order to beat Hitler. And now because of that communism gets a soft play in the United States. And people always wonder like, why is it people are so soft on communism? It's a very, very deep, deep mythological reason. It's because we comp- the, our society is based on a very deep compromise in which we gave half of Europe to an evil empire in order to stop the war. So it's like there are these really deep sins that are at the origin of our of our civilization that that we can't see. People kind of can't see them. But I know and that the, and that's not necessarily sacrifice, but it's like a weird sin that's at the origin of things. Well, I think it's, I think it's very related, right? I mean, Gerard's magnum opus is called "Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World." It, mm-hmm. These are the things that we don't want to admit about about humanity, about our own um, violence. In Christian terms, you could say sinfulness, right? About about our own weakness and frailty, the denial of death, all these things. There's these these things hidden since the foundation of the world are our own propensity to murder and cover up, and 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 to, and to cover up these things under rituals, under institutions. Right? There's all kinds of like rituals in the world that are really um, for the sole purpose of preventing violence. Right? Mm-hmm. This is like a very important part of Gerard's theory. Is like there's there's an initial act of the scapegoat mechanism. That happened at some point, and then it's re it's it's ritualized after that, mm-hmm. right? In the form of 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 rituals, right? So companies can have these rituals, like a lot of sports, I think, developed, right? Especially like in the Roman Colosseum, like developed as rituals to prevent the spread of more violence. Yeah, but that's the scapegoat mechanism is always about stopping the spread of more violence, right? So Gerard's line, Satan casts out Satan. It's like I need to do a little bit of violence in order to prevent a lot of violence, yeah. which is a dangerous way to think, right? It's this like very sort of calculating way to think. I think it's terrible ethics. It doesn't account for the dignity of the human person. There's all kinds of problems, but the, Gerard is saying that that's, this is the pattern that humanity constantly falls back into is thinking that we can prevent a lot of violence through targeted violence, through making scapegoats. 
um, but we always need to find another one. That's the cycle that you know Christ stopped right by becoming willingly the, the, the scapegoat. Because some of the imagery in the story of Christ definitely has to do with this in the sense that even in many of the church fathers, they'll often say, or in the hymnography, we hear, you know, how the world is created from the side, from Christ's side. That is in Christ being pierced, you know, the water and the blood that come out is the church. It's actually the world. St. Maximus talks about the world is being created, you know, while Christ is, is dying on the cross. And this sense that the world comes out of his side, like Eve comes out of, of Christ's side, or the church comes out of his side. And so there is there, it seems like the symbolism is carried in to Christianity. But like you said, it's kind of flipped or it's it's subverted because, because it's a form of self-sacrifice. Then it's like the, the the civilization that gets founded is ends up not being the Roman civilization that pierced Christ, but the, the civilization that Christ is secretly planting is the one that will rise up and take over Rome ultimately uh mm. never completely but at least enough for the for 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 the transformation to be to be real yeah um, and that symbolism the symbolism that you're describing like you know the blood and water that flowed from the side of Christ, the, the eucharist itself is 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 has all kinds of symbolism right mm. you're talking about like like blood blood and and body right and the the it itself is constituted through a sacrificial uh, act right. You have to crush grapes until they can become so, and 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 the wheat into the bread. So all, all of the 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 language and the symbolism of sacrifice is uh, is now non bloody sacrifice is thoroughly infused in the symbolism of of the liturgy. Um, at least the, the one that you and I I, I think both know. Um, but this idea that the the victim. I think it's really important to just to get at this idea of the scapegoat mechanism becoming less effective because of society's concern for victims and nobody hated. So, which, you know, Gerard would say this, our, our concern for victims is the universal value that now unites the world. Pretty much who will you ever find that says that you shouldn't be concerned with victims or, you know, people being injustice, right? Um, and Girard says, this is really the fruit of the revelation of the scapegoat mechanism. We've now seen something that we can never unsee. And mm -hmm. it sort of led over 2000 years, it led over a very long period of time to that becoming the, the most important value in the world to the point that there's now mimetic rivalry over who can be the best victim because nothing is, nothing confers more status and power than becoming a good victim. It's a weird, weird um, paradox and inversion of, yeah. of like the true nature of, of, of Christianity. Right. And so did and, Gerard, my understanding is that at the end, towards the end, he also started talking about the pattern of antichrist as related to something like that, something like a kind of twisting of the, the twisting of the, the recognition of the victim into something like a, like a, a disturbed version of Christianity or something. Well, like there, there's, there's, there's two, there's two ways out of the conundrum that society has got itself in according to, this is my reading of Girard. Um, so one is Nietzsche who, who Girard thought was like the most important philosopher um, of, of the last 150 years, because nobody saw so clearly um, the role of Christ who he compared to the, the Dionysus myth and um, Dionysus, by the way, is the, is the god of insanity and ritualized madness who unites people in ecstasy and drunken parties mm -hmm. and, and blesses the, the scapegoat, essentially the scapegoat mechanism. And he says, you know, no, nobody saw the, what the, the Christian story was about more than Nietzsche, but he rejected it. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, you know, the concern for victims is slave morality and you know, we need to do away with the concern for victims. And not only that, in fact, victims should be like the weak, like the protection of it, they should be sacrificed in the name of society, right? Achieving some higher levels of being, which indirectly led to Nazi socialism, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, so, so there's the Nietzsche approach that the concern for victims needs to be eradicated because this is the slave morality of Christianity or something like that. And then on the on the flip side, you have the Antichrist and the Antichrist is um, 
the way one way that I would describe the I don't like the term, but the so-called culture wars mm -hmm. is essentially the culture, or really the secular culture, trying to be more Christian than Christianity or more Christian than Christ, and saying we care for victims more than um, than you Christians do, right? Mm -hmm. Or this is the Grand Inquisitor and Dostoevsky, right? Like if you cared so much, to, you know, we do a better job at caring for victims than the church has ever done or whatever. Right. Mm. Um, and, and, and so there's this weird rivalry almost that, that is um, in, in some way, the culture is like a, a mimetic rival to Christianity to the extent that the two of them get in a weird uh, double bind uh, mimetic war. It's really bad for both, especially for Christianity. Um, and the anti, what is the antichrist, but the, the one that comes along and does the best job at that. He totally unites humanity, promises peace, promises to to be, you know, to have the utmost concern for all victims, to end poverty, to do to do all of those things that Christianity promised and couldn't do. So in a sense, because of a lack of sort of eschatological sort of understanding of of and, and teleology, the Antichrist replaces Christianity by almost becoming what those who have rejected Christ want him to be, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's one thing also about Gerard, which which puzzles me a little. It's my understanding, and maybe you tell me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that he also had a sense in which the scapegoat, after being sacrificed, was also deified somehow, like or was placed in a in a in a position of 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 honor, like a high position after the sacrifice. So maybe if you can talk yeah. a little bit about that, because I'm not sure I understand, like, I've seen it. I've actually seen it myself. I There, there are some African tribe I remember dealing with in Congo named the Kuba tribe that they they had they had chased the pygmies out of their land. And they had a mask, which was a pygmy mask. And the pygmy mask was something that they would like, it was one of their most sacred objects and they would honor it. But they also would see the, the pygmies as like basically like forest demons at the same time. It was like, it was just this weird thing. I didn't understand. Well, that's a, that's a huge part of his theory. And, and it's, it's because nobody has the power to unite a, um, a community that's embroiled in mimetic violence, which would otherwise destroy itself. Right. Mm -hmm. That this, the, they can't save themselves. And the, the, the only thing that will unite them together, one way to think of it, the only thing they can agree on, the only desire that, that will unite them is a shared contempt for and hatred of the scapegoat. So the scapegoat unites them together in this act, in this ritual act of, um, and by the way, like the, the scapegoat ritual almost always happened through a, a long process of you know, they would parade the scapegoat in, in, in Greece. It's called the pharmacos. They would parade the pharmacos through the streets, um, whip them, um, you know, mock them, um, all the things that remind you of the crucifixion, by the yeah. way, um, for days. And it would, that was important because that's, that gave the people a sense of catharsis mm -hmm. um, and, and released all of the pent up um, mimetic violence that they were aiming at each other, they can collectively aim at the at the single scapegoat mechanism. They expel the scapegoat, kill the scapegoat, do whatever horrible thing they do to the scapegoat. And then magically, ma magically in quotes here, right? Because this is the false transcendence, there they achieve some level of temporary peace um, and unity with each other. It feels good, they, that, that what Aristotle talked about, that catharsis. So what ends up happening a short time later is that they, they, the, the scapegoat almost always in ancient cultures comes back, is, is worshiped. They'll, they'll build a shrine over the site where the scapegoat was killed. They'll do something like that because the scapegoat takes on like a, like a sacred power because it's the only thing that had the power to solve their problem. So, and who, outside of themselves and that has the nature of a god or some something that you worship some so like a higher being that was able to somehow so, solve the problem is attributed is projected onto this the scapegoat um and this I, I know this is a little weird for people listening it's kind of it's a little hard to understand but um you know think about great figures in history that like are not revered until after they die 
I mean, mm-hmm. this this happens like all the time, like people that were assassinated, murdered, um, who begin to sort of like take on almost a sacred aura. I mean, and we have myths uh, throughout all of our stories, right? In Tolkien, you've got, you know, Gandalf the White comes back and, and he's sort of more powerful than before. Like, I mean, we, we just, this is like just part of the, the human story. We have this sort of idea in our imagination somehow. And, you know, this may be a controversial statement, but I think it happened most recently, maybe with the death of George Floyd, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, 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 it sort of had this, this sort of um, almost, there's been like sacred connotations that have been attached to, to, to that, to, to, to him now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've, you know, I've seen him like depicted as like, as like Christ. Oh yeah. As an angel. Sacrifice and things. Right. Things. And, and there, and there's the element of, of, you know, uniting people around the world and building shrines. Um, and there is a bit of that, uh, like almost a process of deification, um, is how Gerard would describe it. Right. And deification is, I, I think is, is more of in, in sort of the Orthodox tradition, right. The whole like spiritual, like life is is often described as a process of deification mm-hmm. um but this is almost like a false de- a false deif- deification which goes back to the false transcendence where the real deification right being united and becoming more like god um becoming holy all of those things is is the is a real sort of positive sense of deification mm-hmm. yeah well that i mean it's interesting especially because a lot of people point out in the George Floyd story how he was a criminal, how he had done horrible things. And so in this theory or in this vision, it, it almost serves the purpose. Like it actually almost narratively and mysteriously would function as a way in which it would even make it stronger that he would then ultimately kind of unite people together and act as this 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 new angel that appears, let's say, and as over over this question. And I hadn't thought about it that way. It, um, yeah. yeah, you know, I think I think Qaddafi did the same thing to to the to the to people. Um, you know, Qaddafi, you know, by all accounts, was not really a a, a good man. Uh, I don't think he was a good leader. I think he, you know, had committed crimes. And um, what one uh, very well known Gerard scholar, Mark Ansbach, I like his work a lot. He said, in fact, it's because of Qaddafi's um, kind of guilt that helped him become a better stand-in for the guilt of everybody else if that mm-hmm. makes sense right this goes back to the similarity thing right it's it's almost as if because he's guilty he he can be an easier substitute or sacrificial victim for the <coughs> guilt for the guilt of everybody else in the country and if you read and he was literally lynched in the street yeah. Right. Like these horrific images. And if you read what some of the people said uh, in Libya, he, they, they, one, one guy in particular said all of the evil has now been purged from our country. Right. Like in a, a couple of days after he died, you just can't have a more sort of textbook example of, of that happening. And they why do they have to get rid of his body? Well, because right away there were going to be shrines built to it. Um, well. And they were they were they were actually like worried about that process of deification happening, huh? Huh? So here's a very difficult question: Does Girard talk about about the manner in which it seems, at least to me, that something similar happened to Hitler? It's like the Germans were able to put all their guilt into one person. And and to kind of absolve themselves, to, not totally, but at least to some extent, and even he, <clears throat> the West in general, to by by making Hitler the one evil, the one evil player, like the one that that like the, the the one person that is the cause of it all. It seems like there's something of that going on there, like where we 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 just put all the evil in him, and he's still like. Still today, it's like he is the ultimate evil character, the one in which all evil kind of lands. Let's say, the, yeah, the, the personification uh, of of all evil, like almost standing in for taking the place of um, of a satanic figure or or Satan himself, right? Like, there's almost something. Um, there's almost it's almost as if humanity. Um, 
told its told itself a story for a certain amount of time that like you know we took care of um you know hitler ended in demise we we took care of the problem um you know we built these institutions it'll never happen again we built the memorials and and all of the evil has been personified in this one figure yet the scapegoat mechanism runs rampant throughout the world um even still mm -hmm. and part of the problem with mimetic violence and the scapegoat mechanism is the diversion of attention and i think mimesis in general has to do with what we pay attention to and what we and what we focus on mm -hmm. um what we become obsessed with and because the only way that a scapegoat is made is if attention becomes focused in a group on a single individual through this kind of mimetic process, mm -hmm. um, which diverts us in what, which involves projection, which involves uh, of all of our shortcomings and our own violence and our own sins onto this one person. And then it involves a process of transference and all of those things simply kick the can down the road and don't deal with any kind of structural problems, any kind of structural sin, um, our own um, propensity to to do to do violence, right? Which we need to remind ourselves of. So you would you could say that Gerard had a very Augustinian or or, or, or sort of dark uh, view of, of 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 human nature and sort of against sort of enlightenment rationality, where like oh we just we all get like you know we just read a lot of books and we discover these secrets about the world and and therefore like we can purge violence from our midst it's like stephen pinker 101 you know what yeah. i'm saying and it's like like not not recognizing like sort of these ancient forces that that are still very much at work that now just manifest themselves in different ways and because the ways they manifest themselves are different um we might not recognize them um, you know, we're we're not usually in some parts of the world, but we're usually not literally, um, you know, murdering people and dragging them through the streets. Mm -hmm. We're just doing it in in other sort of spiritual ways, often, right? Which you know, the gospels actually talk about that under the context of murder. So yeah. you know, I think this the scapegoat mechanism is just evolving and, and transforming. Yeah, for sure. The cancel the cancel culture that we're seeing happening is definitely has some of the scapegoat mechanism in it, you know, the way that it that manifests itself. It's like, we need to find, especially like the, the hunt, almost like the hunt for, for someone to cancel. Like we need to find the next person. We need to purge the world of, of, of these, these two people. And if we do so, then we'll, we'll find some kind of paradise. Um, and so then, then you have the other version, which I don't, which I'd like to know what you think about that, because I mean, Jordan Peterson is kind of brought, brought out this new vision of of Solzhenitsyn's uh Solzhenitsyn's way of seeing this which is the idea of of self-blaming you could say or of seeing our taking the sins on ourselves uh and that that could be the right transformational process to actually change the world ultimately and you see that of course like I said in terms of the the martyrs how they're willing to die despite their innocence you see it in terms of monastic practice where the monks will take the blame on themselves, even for other people's sins, that kind of stuff, which I would never do. But it's like I, you see it happen in, in monasteries where where the, the spiritual father would like actually take the blame for other people's uh, things. Um, and so I don't know if you if, if Gerard has talked about that, if you've thought about that as well. I have thought about that. And, you know, that has to do with, um, again, with self-sacrifice and with accepting certain um, injustices that are committed against you, you know, perhaps even taking on injustices from other people without always seeking uh, retribution, which, you know, I think Gerard says is the, is, is the satanic lie, right? That the retribution or, you know, the, the line from the gospel, Satan casts out Satan. It, it has everything to do with that principle, right? That, you know, that, that little bit of violence will, will somehow do good. That violence can do good. Um, the self blame thing is the flip side of that. It, this is a, something I was reading Gerard last night, um, and I pulled up a quote. So I think this is relevant to what you're saying. I'm just going to read it. He said, since, since Christians have become aware of their failings in charity of their connivance with established political orders in the past and present world that are always sacrificial. So basically, since Christians are sort of accusing themselves of their own failings in charity 
and have been part of sacrificial political orders in the past and even now. They are particularly vulnerable to the ongoing blackmail of contemporary neo-paganism. That's mm-hmm. a quote from Rene Girard. So that's there's a lot there right, to, to unpack. But one way that I interpret that is that because it's almost like the accuser, right? This ancient language of the accuser and the advocate. And when the accuser accuses you of your your own sins and shortcomings and, and, and failings, what Gerard is basically saying, like the, the church, the, the, the Christian world has, has been, is being accused of all of these things and has been for a very long time, right? This goes back to, you know, that we we care about victims more than Christ cares about victims, right? Then they're sort of uh, susceptible to the blackmail of neo paganism, right? Which is sort of like um, holding um, is is the is the accusation that because the, you know the history of Christianity has not been perfect, that therefore it should cede all of the story and all of the kind of right to, to like, let's just elect like a great president and he'll solve all of our problems. Right. Or something like that. Um, so there's something to be said about this, about the self blame, right? Cause there's a negative sort of form of that, which I think comes under the, which comes from the accuser. Yeah. Which doesn't but that's, necessarily that self blame is, is different because it's a weaponized, it's like weaponized compassion. You know, I've talked about this recently in terms of uh, in terms of if you want to recognize the difference between true, let's say, taking on of sins or the true uh, examining of yourself in order to see, you know, the, the, the good and evil going through your own heart. The difference between that and weaponized compassion seems to be exemplified in the story of Judas. When you see Judas, it, when the woman comes to per, pour the perfume on Christ's feet. Judas says, you know, you should give that to the poor. It's like, that's exactly, that's exactly what, what we're talking about in terms of, you know, you know, I, I will care for the poor, right? That's, that's what I'll do. But in the story, what's interesting is like, it's actually, I will care for the poor rather than worship the divine, you know, worship God. And so she's actually worshiping the son of man. And he's saying, you know, you should give to the poor. But in, in the scripture, it says, but what he was really doing was taking the money for himself. And I think that that's usually when you can see it, because you just have to watch people who will want to, uh, let's say, accuse Christianity of all the sins. And you and then you just have to look a little bit and realize that it's it's actually a power play to take to 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 gain power for themselves. Mm-hmm. There's nothing authentic about it at no. all. And, and the, the accuser, well, the, just a really important point to make. Is that the accuser is always is never the truth yeah the accusation is never the truth right because the accuser in scripture and I, I guess you know in 2022 it can be weird for some people that hear these two guys talking about satan or the satanic principle but i mean gerard identified the scapegoat mechanism with um sort of the spirit of satan mm-hmm. and what is what is how is what are some of the different ways that satan is referred to that jesus refers to satan in the gospels the accuser right? The father of lies and a murderer since the beginning. So the accuser is always lying, right? There's always, there's always like some, some element of lie there. It's not the whole, at the very least, it's never the whole truth Yeah. yet. It's, it's very easy to believe. Um, and I think that's where that spirit of accusation is what's behind cancel culture. And it's part of my personal, just in my personal examination of conscience. It's like, how am I being an accuser and how am I being an advocate, right? The advocate is usually refers to the Holy Spirit in scripture. Um, how, who in my life is an accuser? Who in my life is an advocate? Um, what in the culture is, is operating on the prince, uh, like literally gets power from accusation mm-hmm. because anything that, that derives power from accusation, you might say like all of Twitter is basically like this. I hope Elon Musk can solve that problem. Um, <laughs> it is, is, is certainly concerning to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. There's definitely something, and there's also the hip, the hypocrisy part of the accuser, which I think Christ points out quite a bit in his ministry. You know, where he sees the accusers in terms of the the Pharisees, and he says, 
that the accuser is often hiding his own his own sin and uh and that in the case of judas that's definitely the case where judas is accusing the woman of not caring for the poor when in fact you know he just wants power for himself um and so there's definitely a lot of that going on in terms of in terms of the politics and also the yeah even even in terms of of the the, the fingers being pointed you know yeah yeah and you know that's the, the story of the woman caught in adultery is i think the most mimetically charged um aside from the crucifixion in in, in the gospels right it's just it's literally there's a mimetic process of accusation that's taking place um and it's diffused by the only person in the story this is the woman who was caught in the act of adultery so we know mm -hmm. she's guilty right they drag her in front of the temple in in the gospel of john um you've got these pharisees saying she's guilty of breaking the law of moses she deserves to be stoned and there's this mimetic process of contagion everybody in the story is an accuser except her and one other person mm -hmm. and you know christ steps into the story as the only person who stands outside of the mimetic processes, the only person who's not susceptible to them, right? Um, one, he's a divine person <laughs> um, and, and, and free of sin. So he's the only, in a sense, most people don't think of that story as, as, as him diffusing the stoning um, as a miracle. But if what Gerard is saying is true and that this is the mimetic process of violence that's been operative. It's the thing hidden since the foundation of the world. It's the way that what humanity has always done. You could almost say that there's some kind of divine intervention where the only anti-mimetic, the only person not um, participating in the pattern of mimetic contagion in that story was Christ, which is the only reason he's able to diffuse it. And this is the reason that people are really scared to step in and stop um, we don't really stone people in this country uh, anymore, um, but people are really scared to step in and avert a cancel, a cancellation or something like that, because then they themselves get get singled out. Right? Yeah, and they so know everybody's scared. scared. Everybody just runs for the hills when something like that happens. So I've often asked myself, like, we don't give ourselves enough credit for having the power to, because sometimes it just takes one person to be a subversive, like, break in that process and and you know like in the gospel story christ totally reverses it they drop their stones and walk away and it's one of the be the reason it's one of my favorite sort of stories is because it's negative mimetic violence that's instantly transformed into positive mimetic desire or positive mm -hmm. like a positive form of mimesis because it says the first the elders starting with the elders they drop their stone models of desire mm -hmm. and then one by one the rest of them left right so the elders dropped the stones and the rest of them left. You know, it's possible to actually affect some positive contagion of, of desire and examination. Yeah, but it's difficult. It's difficult because we are caught up in the mimetic desire ourselves. And so we also see that, you know, it's like the reason why you're afraid of being canceled is because, you know, you're not perfect. You've got, you know, everybody has things that you look back and you're like, oh, you know, I'm not, I definitely have sins in my past. So yeah, it's difficult, but you're right. There are some people that seem to be able to, to do it. And, uh, and when it happens, it's, it's very powerful. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Well, you're, you're the, you know, it's, I don't know if the observer problem is the right way to talk about this, but we are ourselves. It's weird talking about mimesis and mimetic desire and mimetic contagion because like at this very moment, I'm I'm being affected by forces that I probably don't even know, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm very much like inside of the the same story that I'm talking about, which makes all of these things um, somewhat day. I would even say dangerous to talk, yeah. you know, not 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 to talk about, but like to to pretend or to operate under the illusion that we can achieve some kind of permanent. Um, you know, um, abstraction or mm -hmm. removal from them, right? Like we're, we're embedded in these things. And like, one of the things I, 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 I hope that when I, you know, walk in to go in my parish every Sunday, like, you know, for an, for an hour, it sort of feels like I'm, you know, I'm no longer in the world. Right. Um, and then no, you're within, totally right. Within, within, and then within, within one minute of leaving, I'm like, you know, yelling at the guy who cut me off in the parking lot. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, because I mean, it's 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 like we're making this video. We're gonna put it on YouTube. You know, it's gonna get likes. It's gonna get comments. It's going to get shared. 
these are the mimetic these are all these mimetic things that are on steroids right now in terms of social media and so it's definitely something that we are we are part of and it's difficult to pull like you said it's difficult to pull ourselves through um and we kind of hope that the eucharist and you know participation in the in the self sacrifice of christ if we do it if we do it regularly and properly that we it can somehow at least like you said give us a different perspective you know yeah, yeah. but then also noticing the times i think like at least in my case i think noticing although it, like you said sometimes it, does, it it still is in a mimetic process but noticing the times where i've been able to just say give myself or sacrifice some aspects of myself for others and then seeing the fruits of that you know it's like wow that works like it's not just a, it actually really does do something uh but then that can also be that can also become a mimetic a mimetic competition you know if you're not careful it's funny isn't it i i um i spent a few years living in rome because i was in seminary studying theology and uh it, the, it's it's a it's an alarming thing when you realize that the guys um that are participating in that process of formation like start competing um on in, in, in engaged in mimetic rivalries with each other in regards to like how long they're in the chapel praying and like who's praying on their knees and who's not and stuff like that like it's we can literally like anything can turn into this you yeah. know if, we, if we're not aware of it and if we're not vigilant I even mean, things that can be like good right like I'm, I'm i'm here trying to like make this sacrifice and give of myself to the world and and you know grow in virtue and yet I can look to you know my right and my left and and get totally distracted from like what in the hell I, I even came here for in the first place. Yeah, and it's I mean Christ seems to be warning us about that, and it can help us understand some things that Christ says when he talks about the importance of secret, right? The importance of doing things in secret, because when you do things in secret, if you give in secret or you pray in secret or you 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 don't get the credit for it, uh, then it's actually a it 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 can be a good healing mechanism or maybe a good a good kind of position in which you can find yourself where you can now see you know what's going on a little more clearly because you're you're not getting any you're not getting anything from what you what you've done uh so that's interesting to think about yeah Listen, I think this has been a great, this is great conversation. Uh, I I appreciate it. It's, we, we're having a a more spiritual conversation than I than I was. Uh, I like that. I, I I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and so I will just send everybody towards your towards your towards your book. It's called Wanting, and uh, it has great. Uh, Peter Thiel gave it a great review, and and a lot of I was really impressed to see how much how much it's gotten positive reactions and. I think getting people to think about these questions is important, especially with social media, the acceleration of social connection and the, the, the acceleration of contagions of these types of contagions is so everything's so fast now and it can happen so quickly that under, at least understanding some of the mechanisms is, is useful for everybody to understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank, thanks, Jonathan. I really hope we can uh, continue the conversation sometime. I appreciate Great. it. Great. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, man. Thanks.